like a ninja. So a lot of prep work to do this week. My dad's come to pick his skid steer up. He's got a project that he needs to do with that. And I also got to get ready for the concrete pad, the new you know, half of the shop to be poured. But I have to have rebar first. So I'm going to help my dad get the skid steer back to his place. And then you know, we're going to head out and try to get some rebar for the shop, along with some gutters, because you know, I'm tired of the swamp. It's, generated beside the shop every time it rains. than too little. So here in the not so distant future, I've got some work that I got to do on this skid steer for my dad. The lift arm on it's got several stress fractures just from, I guess, metal fatigue. Somebody had tried to fix them in the past and failed. You know, just kind of bird splattered all over the top of some cracks, and you know those just didn't hold. So you know, before long, this thing's going to go back down to the house, and we're going to have to cut into it pretty good. And, fix all the stress fractures in it. It's just common, right? It, it happens to all of them, but you know, this one's needs to be repaired before it gets any worse. If you look at the bucket arm here, you can see where some fresh paint is there and just a glob of weld. You know, somebody tried, but it really needs to be cut back and some good weld laid in there for this thing to stop you know, the cracks progression, I guess. So since the truck and trailer are already hooked up, me and my dad are going to run to town, pick up the rebar that I need for the concrete and the shop floor, and you know just get that out of the way. It's quite a bit of rebar, 20 foot long sticks, so definitely require a trailer to go get. And you just, you know, you want to buy it in the longer section simply because it's, it's cost prohibitive to buy a short piece of rebar. There's just not much difference in a 10 foot stick and a 20 foot stick when it comes to price. And we're, if you notice, we're using these little magnetic trailer lights just because they work, right? Trailer lights are notorious for going out or half working. So, you know, even if yours work, having a set of these stick-on magnetic lights behind the seat is just good insurance for less than 20 bucks. I've had great luck with them, and uh, I would buy them again any day. Barking at butters, barking at your echo. Yeah. 
Either the neighbor or his echo. He barking it. No, but it sure is nice. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Nothing like some flannel sheets that have been hung out on the line. Big store, yep. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, they'll grow so big they all converge into one massive uh, bunch of people. I'm looking for that. So rebar is one of those things that's easily overlooked as far as its expense or its cost when you go to do a floor. Just the rebar for my pad, around 500 bucks. Now this is 60 20 foot sections of number 4 bar and this should allow me to space my bar around a 2 foot center and that should be more than enough considering my pad is going to be about 7 inches thick from the research that I've done. You know that's, that should be more than strong enough really. I also picked up some gutters while I was out with my dad. We were noticing that it's pretty cheap. Gutter material and gutter hardware is relatively cheap. I was going to have somebody come out and just make gutters for this thing and be done with it, but I thought it may be a fun project, actually. And uh, it looks like something that about anybody could do as far as, uh, you know, if you're a DIY person. Uh, so. Maybe it may interest you. I've got a parts list. We'll look at that and then maybe get into installing a little bit of these gutters. I'm kind of excited to solve my swamp issue. And sorry if it sounds like there's an echo or if I'm yelling. I've got a shotgun mic on the camera right now. My lavalier mic transmitter receiver suffered some blunt force trauma while I was roofing last week. Got a new mic ordered and they're proud of those. Uh, shocking. But that's part of the biz, I guess. Let's look at uh, the parts list on these gutters and uh, see what we're up against. So let me show you what I got to put the gutters on this place. Now, I'm not affiliated with this company. Everything that I have here is made by Merrimax, and everything on this table is labeled Made in America other than these screws that are labeled Made in Tawan. So I thought that that was uh, promising. So the gutters come in 10 foot sections, they're made of aluminum, and they are 0 0.027 thousandths thick, and feel pretty rigid, so optimistic that they'll last for quite some time. I got two elbows, I got a downspout connector that'll take the water from the gutter and move it into my drain system that runs across the driveway. I got some end caps, a flexible elbow. The brackets to join our 10-foot sections of gutter together and the brackets that hang 
these gutters against the fascia. And I'm pretty impressed with the way that these connect to these gutters. So let me show you the way that that works. And uh, you know, we'll get started. So you can see the shape of the gutter here. And this is the bracket that will hang this gutter. You see it's got a lip in there. And that goes up into that lip like that. And then slides over the back. And then this screw is driven into your fascia and into the truss tail uh, to give it that extra rigidity. But I thought that was really nice, the way that that uh, connects up. The bracket appears to be aluminum, and the screw is hot dip galvanized. So, if installed correctly, I believe this will work pretty well. So this is a two... Each package comes with two gutter union brackets. They're just a slightly oversized version of... Uh, you know, the gutter, and some sealant to seal them. Now I'm going to use the sealant along with some of the screws that you can buy colored to match your gutter uh, to attach these to each piece of the gutter. That way they don't slide apart. Now obviously one piece gutter system is going to be less likely to leak than a piece that's joined every 10 feet. But I think if done correctly this you know, really shouldn't leak and who cares if it does drip a little, right? But we're going to try to not get any drips. Like that. Halfway. Like that. Hmm. Chloe. Chloe is definitely upset about something. Oh, thank you. Are you done with it?
So I think the trick to these gutters at least is using an excess of brackets. Now I use the bracket every two feet. So it screw into the end of every truss tail or through the fascia and then into the truss tail. And they turned out pretty rigid because you you know in time these things are going to fill with leaves and sticks and twigs and become weighted down and start leaking at the joints if you didn't support them properly. So as long as I do my part and keep them clean, I don't think I'll have any problems, but you know, that's yet to be seen. So I tried to keep the gutter under the drip edge as far as I could, but you have to set your gutters at a slight angle. And all I used was a level and just favored one side of it uh, from one end of the building to the other. I do plan to come back and slide some aluminum flashing up under the drip edge and overlap the inside lip of the gutter just to keep that fascia board dry. I don't plan on painting them because they're treated and if I paint them I'll always have to keep them painted. So I think it's easier just to flash it good, keep it dry, and not worry about it, right? Uh, yeah, that's fine. It'll catch the water from here. Now this one has to be angled the other direction because it needs, I don't want it to pull water here, so it has to run towards this. So it runs down to the downspout and then back the other way on this side. masterpiece. We'll see if that'll handle all the water off that side of the roof. That's a lot of roof. So I think that's going to look pretty good. Bracket there. Hold it to the shop. But I gotta get some concrete anchors. Before I can attach it. And I'll put one more up there. And that should uh, hold that in place. And that looks pretty good actually. Right down into the drain system that runs out into the creek. Not too bad. 
So those of you who watched last week's video may remember me mentioning tires, leaving people on the side of the road far more often than mechanical issues. And I probably shouldn't have said anything because my wife got up this morning and she noticed that the driver's side tire on her car was flat. I put some air in it, drove it up here, jacked the car up, got the car in neutral and the emergency brake on. And I'm just looking to see if there's any foreign material stuck in this tire and I don't see anything obvious but it was completely flat. So what I'm doing, airing it up, you know, good and hard. And then uh, I'm gonna use this spray bottle full of soap and water, and I'm gonna spray this entire tire looking, entire tire, looking for bubbles. That way I can find the leak and then hopefully plug it. You know, this tire, well, the tires on this car are due for replacement, but not today anyway. But hopefully this will bubble up if we see, if we hit the hole anyway, or find the hole. There we go, right there. Right in the center. Okay. There is the hole. It's just a paint marker. So I always carry a plug kit in the trunk of my car, just in case. This thing's got me off the side of the road more than once and is worth the few bucks that you invest to make one. Just Odds and ends, fittings, also carry a little air compressor that plugs into your cigarette lighter, you know, for instances like this. So, there's the hole. And I don't see anything in it, so maybe just ran over something and it come out. So, I'm going to just put a plug in this because I'm going to replace the tires on this car. And this is the rasp, what I'm going to run in the hole to clean it out and somewhat size it, I guess, for the plug. If there's any stuff in this thing, there we go. I always put a little bit of the glue on here just to help clean the hole out and keep make this thing slide easier. I've got the tire aired up pretty good, pretty, pretty hard. Just clean the hole out, and I'll take a plug. I don't like plugging tires really, but you know, if you have to, you have to. Pull it through the other tool. Just get it up halfway. Then I take some more glue and put on the plug. There we go, and then a good hard pull out. And there we go. Then I usually will trim the plug back some. And not not too much. I just don't want to leave. I want to put most of the plug inside the tire because you get on the interstate, you know, plugs can fly out, and that's pretty much it. You know, check the tire pressure, you know, go to the service station and get you your tire fixed with a patch or replace the tire. 
So basically, right after I got the gutters installed and the sun went down, we got a really heavy rain. It's raining as of this shot right here. It's raining at this moment. And we didn't have one one leak in the shop, which was great. You know, This is the first rain we've had on the roof since uh, the roof's been replaced. I got up on the roof. Obviously, it was dark. I couldn't film it. Looked at the gutters. They handled all the water that you know, a normal rain would would give us usually because it's raining pretty hard out there but and the noise level in the shop is so much quieter than it was with that tin roof it's exciting i'll say that and i'm happy to be you know, as far along as i am <clears throat> but i was really hoping to get that uh, <laughs> that rebar in here this week but you know, it's easy to plan things a little harder to actually do them especially when you work with limited time so. Maybe next week we we'll get this rebar moving in. Let's we'll see what it says. We'll get some concrete in here. Yeah, that's right. So now that I got my gutters installed on the upper side, here's the paperwork that come with them, made by Miramax. You know how to order. You can get them in all sorts of different colors. They also offer a five and a six inch. Mine are five inch because that's what our store had. Now I'm not affiliated with this company. I bought these like anybody else would. Now I did try putting up connecting two 10-foot sections here on the ground and putting that up, and that was a pain. I think it's a lot easier to install these in their 10-foot sections, you know, and just make your connections from your two gutter pieces up on your fascia board. We got a good rain here. I didn't have any leakage at my joints. You know, they, ran, they moved the water well, and I had no pooling water in my gutter, so I'm happy with the install. I think a person that uses these really needs to Use more hanging brackets than you think you'll need. Uh, I think that's the key to having these last a long time is a well-supported gutter. But so far, so good. I'm happy with it. And from my experience with these, I'm going to put them on the other side because it really wasn't very expensive and it wasn't hard to install. So, you know, there you go. That's my opinion on them. We'll see how well they last. I do see these things in the future leaking at the joints because buildings do swell and contract, but you know, that's yet to be seen. So, who knows? But so far, so good. I'm happy with the install that I did. So let's take a second, do something a little different, something I haven't done in a while, and that's a tool show and tell. Now, a week before last, when my buddy Al and my buddy Andy were down here to help me with the roof, both of those guys brought along with them some tools that they wanted to donate to the shop and some other things that I'll share with you as well. And I haven't even had a chance to look through the boxes that they brought. So we'll do that together. I think that'll be exciting. Now, some of this stuff I have obviously seen because it's laying out, but I've looked at none of it in detail, and we'll, you know, we'll do it together. So I think that'll be kind of fun because I'm excited to start working in the shop instead of on it because it really won't be that long. So let me get these boxes together, and you know, we'll spread them out and look at them. So all the stuff on this table, all very usable stuff. It's as they got it, and it's as I got it. So none of this stuff's been cleaned up yet. All auction spoils, really. Al picked me up these three boxes of 40 taper holders, tool holders, for the little Adcock Shipley mill. I didn't have but one, the one that came in the mill when I got it, and I'm really happy to get these. So let me get you in a little closer. I'll show you what all that's here really quick, and then we'll go around the table, and I'll show you the rest of the stuff. So here is a really good start at your 40 taper tooling collection anyway. Well, just a variety here, right, that was picked up at auction. These are all Cat 40, so I will have to pull, uh, remove the pull stud and make a custom uh, draw bar for that machine. But other than that, these will work. Really nice, uh, what is that, uh, 100 series collet, because I've got a set of collets for this. So that holder right there is very valuable to me. Here is a uh, face mill holder, which is really nice to have, along with some extended arbors, along with those, another 100 series, I think. What is that, uh, like a boring bar, or a, a boring head holder, you know, and some large, just standard uh, end mill holders. There's a Jacob's Chuck. Always nice to have a dedicated chuck on a, uh, on a holder. And then some heat shrink stuff, coolant through, which you know may or may not use, but you could, you know, heat this up, remove whatever's in it, and put you know half inch in mill in there, just dedicated, right? Um, normally used on highly accurate uh, CNC uh, CNC machines, right? So yeah, there's a uh, tap holder, small tap holder, 
You can see how it's spring-loaded there, so you don't have to be in perfect time when you're threading the hole or retracting it, right? You got a little leeway there, so you don't break taps. That's nice. There's a big one in here somewhere. Same deal. So that's pretty, pretty neat, right? So great start, and I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, there's some just standard holders in here as well. So I guess that looks like a reamer there of some sort. But just use tooling, right? Clean it up, and uh, a lot of it will be good to go. So thank you, Al. I appreciate that. So all the rest of the stuff on this table was brought down by my buddy Andy. He, these are all auction surplus, stuff that he bought had duplicates of or just didn't need and thought that I could use. And one of those items is a nice, I guess, Sundestrad bench center. Now this is probably from the early 1900s, I'm guessing, used for checking parts. You could put an arbor between centers, put anything you want on there, rotate it to make sure, you know, like, let's say you sharpened a cutter on the cutter grinder, you could check and make sure that your edges are concentric with the center of rotation. So really nice for checking things. Now somebody has modified this. They've put two riser blocks on it. I'm not for sure. This is probably not factory. You know, originally this head sat down on the on the bed here. You can see they've got two. So good to have these riser blocks, but you know, if you didn't need them, you could always convert this thing back to standard. So we'll have to clean this thing up, stone it off real good, regrind the centers. I have always wanted one of these. It'll be great to use you know, in conjunction with a cutter grinder. So, man, this thing's heavy. So while we're on the topic of bench centers, here's a smaller version of the same tool. Now, I'm not for sure who made this. There is no maker's mark on it. This one is cast aluminum instead of cast iron. It has a movable center on this side, spring-loaded. And this head moves. And then a solid center on this side, which can also be adjusted, but it's not spring-loaded. So I'm not for sure. If anybody knows who made that, uh, you know, tell me in the comments. I think that's pretty neat. Uh, much smaller. Looks like a, you know, maybe a, I don't know, three-inch swing. But neat. So we'll have to see if we can find out some more info on that. So here's a vise that appears to be German. I'm not exactly for sure on that. That's what Andy suspected, and that's what I suspect as well. Little uh, what four inch vise, four by maybe six on its opening. That's got an issue here where the jaw doesn't retract uh, with the screw, but it does it does move freely. I'm just uh, not for sure what it's missing or you know potentially something's broken it. But nothing that can't be fixed. I'm sure. Uh, really small as far as its width. A little mounting. Uh, attachment or not mounting attachment mounting uh, place up front and in the back all hidden and then it has a mounting hole also right in the center or a hole for a dowel for this thing to rotate on a base possibly I'm not for sure it's gonna need some jaws but the, you know that's that's not a problem be a great for the little Adcock Shipley meal so that's nice so here's another vise this is a Bridgeport vise um, much like the Kurt vices, but yet it does not have the jaw that pulls down as you tighten this. But this will be a good vice to use on the big Kearney and Trekker mill. And uh, he said that this vice, when he got it, Andy, when he got this vice, it was one solid piece of rust, basically. And he soaked it in his caustic tank and got it to where, you know, it looks like it does now, which is relatively good, right? It's going to take some work to get it you know, back up into shape. They'll have to make some jaws for it. Somebody's made some here, or just grind these down. Somebody's you know, made some custom jaws for a uh, production setup, I'm sure. But uh, there you go, a little bridge port vise that is in overall pretty good shape, really. It's not got a bunch of holes drilled in it. In fact, it doesn't appear to have any holes drilled in it, which is pretty rare, because I've seen these where they're almost drilled completely in two. Uh, moves freely and uh, probably a good vice really. So here's something that I've wanted for a very long time and that is a granite square. This one has a metal insert on the front here, some small metal inserts on the sides maybe to use along with something magnetic I'm assuming maybe a cylinder square or 
you know, you name it, right? This one also has some quarter 20, what appear to be quarter 20 anyway, inserts in the bottom. So you could bolt this to something or, you know, you get the idea. Uh, you can buy these in all sorts of configurations and get them custom made for about anything. But yet, you know, it's still perfectly usable as a magnetic, or not a magnetic, but as a square to use on the surface plate. So I'm excited to get this. And, uh, you know, I could have used this so many times in the past. So glad to have one now. So here's a really nice box. Now, as far as mics, all I have is up to six inch, or all I had right here is a old Starrett. Yeah, that's a five to six inch mic. And these, I don't own any of this brand, or didn't. This is a Shimmer Tomiko, or Tubular Micrometer Company. Man, that's amazing how light that thing is. That is a what is that? Six to seven, I believe. And that one is carbide faced. Man, that's amazing. I'd, I'd never, never had any of these. So there's a seven to eight non carbide faced. But for me, it doesn't matter on these larger uh, mics because I don't work on stuff that large. So having the carbide face uh, just, uh, you know, doesn't really matter. They're not going to be used enough to wear out. The faces. There is a was it eight to nine. Could use a cleaning and painting, but you know that's easy enough to do. Just dirty. And wow, that, it is amazing how light that is. I can't get over that. Nine to ten inch. Shamir Tomiko Tubular Micrometer Company. Definitely been around the block, but you know, check them with a the standard. If they're good, they're good. And, uh, you know, there you go. Clean it up good and give it a paint job. You know, I'm happy to, happy to have those. So as you can see, a pretty good variety of milling cutters here. I'm going to get a couple of these out that I found that were really interested and share them with you. But for the most part, you know, just standard milling cutters of different sizes. But there's a few here that I found that was really neat and I want to share those with you. So you see this pretty often. Cutters were a big expense for a lot of these companies and they would a lot of times employ a person that ran a cutter grinder and sometimes they would grind these cutters down. Sometimes it was just for a custom, custom part, but sometimes it would be just to get as much life out of these cutters as possible because they were such an expense to replace. So you'll see that a lot. You know, you'll get cutters that there's just almost nothing left on them. And then you get the beginning stages of uh, insert tooling, like this little uh, little shell mill or face mill here uh, with a little set screw in there. Then you can adjust uh, the depth of the cutters here, which are all replaceable. Little carbide faced uh, inserts. I think that's pretty neat. You see you know, the progression of insert tooling you know, started way back in the day. This old uh, carbide insert a mill here. Thought that was neat. Now this one, it cuts, but not very good. I guess uh, it was just maybe a bad grind. Who knows? It doesn't look like it's been ground at all. It just may have been a cutter that didn't cut well from the factory. You know, who knows? But somebody left a note on there just for the next guy. And then here's one that's got a tag on it. That's got their, uh, let's see, it was for Op 30. They ran it at 103 RPMs at 19 and a quarter inches per minute on the feed. It says, this cutter is dull. You know, I wonder if the guy that wrote this tag is even still around, you know. I'm sure that's been some time ago. And then another neat one is this massive Union Twist uh, tool here. It is 8 inches by... Uh, one inch in width and imagine the horsepower it would take to bury that cutter You know at speed. I'm sure there was a lot of machines that did it all day every day But uh, you know take a lot of horsepower to to run that cutter there So yeah, I mean you get the idea a bunch of milling cutters. I, I love looking at them because they all have a little story, you know, you wonder what they were used for because of their profile You know and who's the guy that ran them right or girl?
Man, I cannot wait to get this place done. I'm mean, I'm extremely excited about it. It just I'm getting closer and closer every day. Although I had ambitious plans this week to get rebar in here, be done with this floor, and have the concrete brought in, but you know that just didn't materialize right. I didn't account for all the engine size blocks of stone or rocks in the ground that I had to remove just in order to get this graded. Plus all the other things that I got into this week that kind of you know killed my plans, but. You know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. I've got something really exciting uh, that I want to share with you next week. And it's in the back of my truck right now, a new piece of equipment for the shop. A simple piece of equipment, but yet something that is 100% necessary, in my opinion, for machine shop or engine type work. And it's going to be great in here that I lucked up on and found. Needs some work to get it back up into shape, but that's everything I get. Uh, so I'm excited to get into it, and you'll see. I've got the small version of it already, but I don't have the big version. Well, I didn't until this week, so I'm excited. You'll see it, and uh, it should be nice. So that's it for this week anyway. So thanks for watching. Thanks to anybody who supported me on this project. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, you guys are awesome. I and mean, that's it. So thanks for watching, I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born You're just a flower on your own Waiting for the sun to blow